All right, welcome back. Uh, this is going to be a second one in the same weekend to do another one of the medical school application guide videos. I know that a lot of people are looking for these and I'm trying to juggle as many people's requests as possible. There's a lot of really popular unis going around. So uh, we did Deakin yesterday and then today we're going to be doing University of Queensland. This one's been pretty highly requested and I'm pretty, I was pretty interested in it. But uh, when I went through the process, I think I might actually be knocked out of contention, which I'll get to later in the video. I was really looking forward to it. It was a little bit disheartening to see that I might not actually be eligible anymore. But uh, otherwise, for those of you who are actually looking to apply, good luck to you and hopefully this video is actually very helpful. So first of all, uh, same with yesterday's one as well. UQ is it's another GEMSAS school, so a lot of their process is very much the same as other GEMSAS schools. So I'll refer you either to the Unimelb uh, video or if you can't be stuffed sitting through me rambling on and on for about half an hour, you could also just check out the GEMSAS guide, which I link below as well. And the first few pages set out the generic process that applies to all of them. It's worth investing the time to read through it because if you're looking to apply to a lot of different GEMSAS schools, that will apply to pretty much all of them. So it gives you a good sense of it. So now what we can do in this video is just focus on the UQ specific elements of it and uh, yeah, move through it nice and quickly. All right, so first of all, place types, um, as we always break down, right? So we've got CSP, there are 100 places. BMP on top of that is another 40. So these are both domestic places. Uh, and then we also have a huge international intake at UQ, which I was not aware of actually, um, 190. So there's actually more international students than there are domestic students, which is interesting. UQ making that money. Yeah, that means a total, I didn't actually do my total there, 100, 140, 290, 330 places total as an intake. That's actually quite large. Yeah, it's even bigger than, wow, I think they've overtaken even you, Sid, there on their intake. 330, all right. So minimum requirements. Um, again, these are just the requirements that you need to get over in order to be eligible. It doesn't mean that they're competitive or anything like that. UQ, they need a UQ equivalent of a 5.0 or above for their uh, for their GPA. We'll get to the UQ equivalent thing in a moment. They calculate their, their GPA slightly differently. And then it also says as well that competitive applicants with a GEMSAS GPA between 5 and 5.75 uh, will be reviewed for UQ equivalents. So I guess that means that a GEMSAS GPA between 5 and 5.75 is maybe on the border of falling below a five for UQ. I don't really understand that one, but I just figured that's an important one to put in there. In terms of the key degrees, UQ kind of look at first key degrees and then additional key degrees. So your first key degree is most likely gonna be your bachelor's degree, but they recognize additional key degrees that you may use for GPA calculation, um, which can be things like masters and uh, post, like post-grad degrees basically. So the first, key degree, your bachelor's degree, that has to be a three year full-time equivalent degree. It can't be shorter, can't be a two or a one year. Again, you could probably do, you could probably get away with doing like a three year degree accelerated in two and that kind of thing. But I think most of you will be doing a three anyway. It can be a four, by the way, it has to be a minimum of, of three years in order to make any additional key degrees relevant right, or eligible at that point. So if you did a two year degree um, and then went on and did a master's program, you can't use either of them effectively. They need to see three years at the start. Subsequent degrees uh, are gonna, they, they're allowed to be shorter. They don't have to be three years because I mean, there's not many uh, post-grad degrees that last more than a year and a half to two years, but you've still got to have completed that, that three full-time years equivalent in your first key degree. So subsequent degrees in terms of what is eligible, it's pretty long, it's pretty much all of them actually. It can be a second or like a new bachelor's. So if you did a bachelor of science and you went on and then did a bachelor of like uh, paramedics or something like that, that would, still, that would still count, but the paramedics course would be treated as the subsequent degree. Uh, you can do an honors year, that's counted. Um, you can do a graduate diploma. You can do a post-grad diploma and you can also do a master's program it looks like they don't specify so i'd say by research or by coursework because they also accept phds as well the idea is that the most recently completed degree will be used for gpa calculation uh, the idea is it must have been completed by the end of semester one of 2022 so your application year so if you're say doing a master's program right now and it finishes at the end of this semester you can use that as your gpa calculation even if it was a year and a half or two years and you've got a three-year degree behind it, 
you can just use your GPA from the master's program. If you're going to finish your master's program or honors year or whatever it is at the end of this year, around November, December, then it's not going to be eligible and your GPA calculation will fall back to your first key degree most likely in that case. The other thing is that UQ, so in terms of their GPA calculation, GEMSAS weight everything by the year in which it's completed. So they do the final year, final minus one and final minus two to give them a times three, times two and times one weighting respectively. UQ don't do that. They weight based on relative amounts of credit. So if you've got subjects that are more heavily credited than another, that is gonna give greater weighting proportionally to that subject score and its GPA contribution. All the subjects, another thing to watch out for is in the UQ calculation, all the subjects studied um, in that key degree are included in the GPA calculation. So that includes, uh, uh, that includes failed subjects that are then repeated. The fail goes through with the calculation and then the score from the, rep the repeat of it also contributes. You can't wipe fails effectively. Integrated bachelors and masters and then other similar kind of dual degrees, they get treated as one degree. So if you've done a double degree or if you've done a combined, say, uh, like, let's say, like, let's say you did like a bachelor's in science and then on top of that, you had an attached master's for a year and a half in engineering, for example. If you've completed all of that and you came out of year 12, went into the bachelor's degree because it was a combined package deal, the entire four and a half years is treated as your one degree and your GPA will be calculated based on that. If you've completed a PhD by the end of the semester, then it means that that just gets counted as a 7.0, plain and simple. So a lot of people that are doing PhDs um, are looking at UQ for that exact reason because you can bypass the whole GPA process. Uh, and then if you're doing an honours year, then it means that your honours scores kind of, con that your GPA calculation from it is based on the honours pro process. So first, first class honours, uh, two A's, two B's, H3's and so on like that. And their GPA contributions, again, this is all specified both on the Queensland website and on the GEMSAS guide. So I won't go through the specific numbers on this one, but that's how the honours programs work. They still use the 10 year rule as well, but they again have little exceptions to it. So the exceptions are that if you've studied for at least a half year full-time equivalent within those 10 years, so say you did your undergrad, but you finished it in 2010, it would be outside of the 10 year window. If you came back to study and you did at least a 0.5 full-time equivalent year, at least um, at a university, and you also maintained a 5.0 or above GPA for that period of study, regardless of whether it was completed study or not, then that requalifies your old 2010 degree, right? The GPA from the extra study doesn't get counted, just gets used to qualify the old one, but then the old GPA comes back and that goes through the process. And then you can reuse it and you can get around the, the 10 year currency thing. So if you're a little bit worried about that, you could do literally one semester of something sacrifice six months, requalify your old degree, and then and then you can use it again if it's got a strong GPA, right? Ah, and then actually, so, and then this additional study, it just says may be included. So it looks like if you've got your GPA from the old bachelor's and then you've done say half a year, full-time equivalent study, and you've got a you know GPA of like 6.1 on it, they might combine that into the final calculation as well. It just says may though, it's not a certainty. And then minimum requirements for GAMSAT. So pretty much stock standard, GEMSAS requirements, minimum 50 in all three sections, minimum 50 overall. And GAMSAT scores for selection at UQ are unweighted, not weighted. So section one plus section two plus section three, divide that total by three, you've got your unweighted GAMSAT score. For most people, this is usually a little bit lower um, if they're relying on their section three score. Like mine, for example, mine's an 84 weighted. Unweighted, it drops down to a 78.7, right? Um, so it can have a pretty significant impact if you're relying on your section three like me. Uh, if you've got a stronger section one, section two, then this can actually work in your favor and it can kind of minimize the amount of impact that a lower section three score is having. Now, obviously every uni has things different and UQ is no different from the others in that it does have a difference. That's confusing as hell. It's no different from the others because it does have a difference. Yeah, there we go. So it has prerequisites. It just brought prerequisite subjects in for the 2022 entry 
right about the same time, I think it was the same time that Unimelb scrapped theirs because they held on to the, their classic three prereqs for ages. That was around when I was applying back in 2013. Um, so UQ have two prerequisite subjects that they require. Um, they've got to be at second year level in cell biology and then systems physiology. They do have a list of approved subjects that would be equivalent at other universities and institutions. And they also have a process for like international applicants if you've studied overseas and you want to check the relevance. They also say as well that if your subjects that you're considering may be qualifying as prerequisites uh, not in the list, you can also contact them and get them to check it. And they'll basically background check the, the credentials of that subject and see if it, it overlaps at all. What I'll do though is just run you through like exactly uh, how that works. So I'll use, haven't even gotten it up. That's nice and organized, isn't it? So what I'll do is I'll see, I haven't actually done this before actually, and I'll have a look at the, I'm on the UQ Med website. And here it has the names of the two UQ subjects that they use as prerequisites. So we've got integrative cell and tissue biology and then systems physiology, right? So these would most likely be some kind of principles of cell biology and principles of physiology at most universities in second year. Um, and what we'll try to do is find the equivalence, which it looks like this is it here. So I did um, a Bachelor of Science at Unimelb and I finished it in 2013. I did my, my second year in 2012. And what I can do is, hopefully this is hyperlinked, I can just find my university. So University of Melbourne, which I never know if it's gonna go under University of Melbourne or Melbourne University. It's always hard to find, there we go, cool. And I can look through then the course codes and see if I can find the subjects that I did. So this is a little trip down memory lane. Uh, bio, yep, there we are. So those, those are the two subjects there that I did in uh, second year, although that was actually a first year subject right there. So biology of cells and organisms, that would have been second semester of first year. And then uh, Phys 2008 was principles of human physiology, which I did in second semester of second year. And they then tick the box for cell biology and for systems like that, right? I wonder if there's other ones in there as well. Human Phys, oh yeah, principles of microbiology, I did that one as well. And biochemistry and molecular biology, I did that subject too. Well, I've definitely got them all ticked there. Um, human structure and function, I did that one as well. Didn't do genes, didn't like genetics. And that's oh, nursing, didn't do that. Fundamentals didn't do that. Biology of cells and organisms and principles. Those are repeats of subjects that I saw before. So yeah, so I've got a few categories there that have ticked it. So it means that I meet the prerequisites. However, what, it, what they also have is the 10 year rule also applies to the prerequisites. And this is where I get uh, kind of knocked out of contention, which is just, just as well, right? Um, so because I'll be applying for entry into 2023, although I have to have completed the degree after uh, January of 2013, but unfortunately I did those subjects either in first year or second year, which means that I've completed them as late as the end of 2012, which is just outside of the window, literally by a few months. So I actually don't have uh, those in contention anymore. I completed them, but did not complete them within the 10 year window. So make sure you check that if you're on the cusp like me, um, your degree has to be within 10 years, so does the prerequisite study as well, right? Um, I'm not too fussed because I'm gonna be applying lots of other places. It's a bit of a shame because UQ was definitely on my radar as one of the top preferences for me um, and it intrigued me, but at the same time, it's like, oh well, it's unfortunately, I'm out on that one. Then finally, we've got uh, is a few different, again, entry schemes. So we've got the indigenous applicants, uh, this same kind of process again, where you can apply direct to uni or you can apply through GEMSAS. If you apply direct to the uni, then you don't need a, a GAMSAT score. If you apply via GEMSAS, then you do. Uh, and UQ also make a recommendation that if you're gonna be applying as an indigenous or Torres Strait Islander applicant, and you do have a valid GAMSAT score, they say best off applying through GEMSAS and putting your indigenous entry application through there. Um, and I'd imagine that's also because then you're able to streamline it and then use that for any other medical schools that also have an indigenous program as well, right? Or an, an indigenous entry uh, program 
as well. Rural applicants, they obviously have 28% of their places reserved for rural applicants. That is 28% of CSP and 28% of their bonded places split across the two. That is just a federal quota that is met. And there are two adjustments. They say two adjustments are made uh, to the unweighted GAMSAT scores of rural applicants, but they don't say what those adjustments are. And I don't know how you make two separate adjustments unless they may be making individual adjustments to particular section scores. That's all I could I could understand from it if that, that, that they could be doing. But they say they make two adjustments to the GAMSAT score to improve competitiveness of rural applicants. All right, uh, the camera battery died there, so I had to just quickly charge it. Hopefully I've charged it enough to last for this, but we're gonna see how we go. Interview offers are made off of a 50-50 weighting between your GPA and your GAMSAT score, same as most other GEMSAT schools. Um, but they do say that GPA will be used as the tiebreaker. So if they have two applicants that have the same score and they have to choose between them because they're right at the end, GPA is gonna be the winner between the two. The one with the higher GPA wins. Uh, MMIs are likely to be held uh, virtually again in 2022, I would say. They ran them virtually uh, for 2022 entry. And given the way things are going, I think most schools are probably going to opt for online where they can unless their, their interview process really doesn't like it. Then in terms of the offer process, same thing, the 25, 25, 50, 25% GPA, 25% GAMSAT, 50% MMI performance will be used to rank everyone. Uh, and Again, what they'll do is if there's a tiebreaker for the final spot, then they will use the MMI score to determine the tiebreaker. The higher MMI score will be the final decider. If you get a conditional offer, so if you're in your final year and you've not yet completed it by the time the offer comes through, you get a conditional offer. And for UQ, you just have to maintain a 5.0 or above GPA in order to hold on to it. If your GPA slips below five, then they will withdraw the offer from you, unfortunately. Hopefully that's not the case for any of you though. Deferrals, UQ actually allowed deferrals. This is pretty rare, but only in very, very exceptional circumstances. So they say that they'll allow uh, final year students uh, who are deferring their offer because they're gonna take up an honors project in the following year. You can defer for one year only. You can't defer for more than one year. And it has to be because you've already accepted an honors project or are pursuing an honors project and wanna pursue that first and then enter into the MD afterwards. The other one is you can also defer for one year um, if you require a one year mandatory registration process or anything. So um, if for example in dietetics or in pharmacy or in paramedics or that kind of thing, if there's some like professional uh, accreditation registration process that you have to go through and that requires you to enter in a year later, then you can defer for up for a year for that reason as well, but you have to make the special request very early on. And then if you're pursuing a PhD full-time at UQ, you're allowed to defer for up to two years in that case. But it has to be a PhD at UQ and it has to be full-time and that's it. You can't defer for the sake of a PhD at another institution, for example. So hopefully that was all really helpful for the UQ process. Uh, again, it's not the entire thing. Go through the GEMSAS generic process is given in the GEMSAS guide and I do it in the Unimelb. One, this is just all the stuff specific to UQ. Hopefully that's clarified a few things for you in terms of GPA calculation, prerequisites, and their selection process. Um, and then let me know now, I think I've gotten through all of the really hotly requested unis. So now um, in my mind, I'm actually really interested in University of Western Australia. I'll be applying there and I don't know much about it. Pretty sure it's a portfolio school from memory. And I think the other one is, I think there's Freeman, so what is it? Notre Dame, I think, do portfolios from memory. So those interest me, but let me know what you want to see next and uh, I'll take it on request and get that going for next weekend. All right, I'll see you guys next week. Actually, no, what am I doing? Not next week. I'll see you in the next video. Anyway, there'll be another one partway through the week. All right, I'll see you then. The other thing is UQ, can you, hey, what are you doing? Shush. No. Um.